Ron Pattinson joins me this week to discuss the history of stout beers. This is Beersmith Podcast number 277. This is Beersmith Podcast number 277, and it's early March 2023. Ron Pattinson joins me this week to discuss the history of stout beers. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Every issue of Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine is packed with articles for homebrewers and beer lovers. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And I recently updated the payment system for Beersmith to give you more options to purchase or renew your Beersmith desktop and web-based brewing software. You can now purchase two- and three-year licenses at a discount, and you can use Venmo and Square for non-subscription payments. You can purchase a license or start your free trial of Beersmith today at Beersmith.com. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome back Ron Pattinson. Ron is the author of dozens of books on historical beer brewing and runs a blog called Shut Up About Barclay Perkins at BarclayPerkins.blogspot.com. Today, Ron joins us to discuss London Stouts. Welcome back, Ron. Great to have you. Hello. Yeah, it's always fun to have a chat. So how are things going on, uh, going in, in Amsterdam? And what have you been doing the last year? I know you've been probably been working on more historical beer projects, no doubt. Oh, um, I've been doing, writing various things. So, so I've got three books on the go at the moment. One really? Of which is, yeah, one of which is really finished and I should should get out, which is about World War II. Um, I think we discussed I've, that in a previous show we did, the World War yeah, II book. I think last time we were talking about that. Um, and at the moment, I'm most of the way through a book on London Stout, so the, the topic today. So that's why I picked this, because I naturally remember all this stuff, because I'm currently re- writing about it. Um, yeah, just uh, writing lots of recipes at the moment. So um got, got a bit crazy with the recipes, so uh, I'm just going to be, be an awful lot of them. So I'm, I'm up to 135 at the moment. Oh, my goodness. And you brew all yeah. these, I assume? Oh no! I, don't really... <laughs> I just do the recipes. Uh, other people brew them. Yeah, I, do. Uh, I create more recipes than I brew too, as well. So, um, oh, I mean, I mean, my World War II books just got insane numbers of recipes in it. It's got over five hundred. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so what was your third book? You mentioned you had three. Oh, the third one is uh, my book, which is about the period eighteen eighty to nineteen fourteen, which. Yeah, it's probably the golden age of British brewing, really. Um, I, f- I find it one of the most interesting periods, one where the, they've really got their act together. You've got a nice set of styles. Um, kind of kind of the height of the empire, too, right? Yeah, and, and it's also the height of the British brewing industry. It, it really goes into, into decline after, after, say, about 1904, 1905. Hmm. And never really recovered back to the the level it had been before then. So the 1890s are like the r- really good time for for British brewing. So um, there's lots of money around. There's uh, because a lot of them go go public at that point, so they get huge amounts of cash, which they then use to go out and buy pubs mostly. Um, so they have these huge estates of pubs that have cost them a fortune, which is quite quite strange. But um, yeah, so. And the beers are still full strength, so you, you're getting proper strength stouts and not the sort of stuff that you end up with uh, after the war. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I wanted to mention, too, you got your, we talked talking before the show, you've got your hometown in the background. Yeah, so that's uh, Newark on Trent. That's Newark Castle. It looks very impressive from this side. You have to realize that there's nothing around the other side. It was all knocked down at the end of the Civil War. So you've only got the bit <laughs> on the Trent that's still there. Oh, I see. And you're, uh, you're, but you're located in Amsterdam right now, right? Yeah, I'm in located in Amsterdam. I'm there now, for a so. number of years, yeah. Oh, very long time. Yeah. Well, I, I've been looking forward to today's show. Uh, Stout, Stout happens to be one of my favorite styles. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about the different varieties of Stout uh, that started around London, England, and, uh, and of course, Ireland? Yeah, well, uh, the, the original Stouts are, are English beers. The, it, it means it predates Porter. It, it doesn't mean imply a dark beer it's just simply the word for strong beer so stout in older brewing parlance merely means strong and so you 
what became modern stout probably yeah it would have existed before porter did so brown stout is just a strong beer made from brown malt and you had pale stout as well and amber stout and it was all just about what base malt you used um and so ones which used all brown malt which was the same as porter they were called brown stout it's fairly simple sort of naming system and that name brown stout stuck around for an awfully long time i think there's there were even still breweries in the 1990s and 2000s in Britain who had beers called Brown Stout. There might even still be some of the older mm. ones. So it was a, a term that hung around for a very long time. Well, we probably uh, should point out that most stouts, uh, or most of the malt, particularly at, before the 1700s, was done over wood fires. So uh, um, probably... Well, <laughs> it varied. It varied. It depended on where they were. I mean, I mean the, 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 the brown malt that the London brewers used was mostly straw derived. Hmm. They used the stuff from Hertfordshire. And, and so some places they used uh, wood, um, but it varied. And also you find with some of the types of brown malt, they'd use wood right at the end. This is even when you've gone over to to, to uh, using coke as a fuel, just to get a really intense heat and to get some sort of burnt flow, flavor into it. If, if you ever, some, some of the people uh, want Andrea Stanley of, Valley malt. She made a yeah. brown malt, especially for us, for a Goose Island beer. And when you see when they were making that, the last phase of it, it looks really scary. There's flames going all over the place. Um, they were doing it outside, thankfully. And the and the reason they stopped making brown malt that way was because the kilns kept burning down. They had too many fires, and eventually they decided to stop using that method because yeah, they fancy still having their malt kilns there at the end of the process. Is it true to say that uh, a lot of the historical beers were were probably darker than a lot of the beers we drink today, though? Uh, not necessarily. The, no? The, uh, no, Martin Cornell recently did a very interesting piece about this, saying about how, how pale malt was around long before people started malting with Coke. Hmm. Um, and and, and you how, see do, it how do they make it then? Air dried. Just the same way as they as they uh, as the the malt for Vit beer or for uh, Berlin of Weisse, air, air dried malt originally. Hmm. Interesting. Um, well, let's get back to stout. Uh, you mentioned that stout didn't always mean uh, a dark beer. Uh, when did that transition happen where we started talking about, you know, stout being a dark beer versus uh, versus just a strong beer? Um, quite late. I've actually got one brewing record for pale stout from Barclay Perkins, which is and it's from 1805. And it's the only example I've seen. But evidently, some other brewers did carry on brewing it a little bit longer. So it probably goes on until the 1820s, 1830s. It's still knocking around. Hmm. So uh, basically 100 years after Porter appears. So, yeah, it, it's not like it just went away immediately. And and, and talking of colour, <laughs> it's really interesting when you, when you look at the colour of Porter and Stout. And see the way it changed over the years in, in reaction to the sort of materials that we're using, um, sometimes to do with uh, consumer taste, I think. So when you look at the one, the ones from the, the the original ones, which were all brown malt, they weren't black. They were a dark brown color. Hmm. And then it's only when you start getting black malt introduced that the color changes. So, I mean, I'm lucky that I've got brewing records from the period before 1817 and the period after 1817. And you can see this massive change in the grists that they were using. So if you look at, say, um, 1816, <coughs> the grists are mostly 40% brown malt, 60% pale malt. So you get a beer that's not that dark from this, from this mixture. And then you see after black malt become, is introduced in 1817, at first, what they do is just cut down the brown malt content and use a relatively small amount of black malt, often only about one and a half, two percent of the grist. And then as the 19th century goes on, they use more and more and more. So by the time you're getting up to the end of the century, the black malt content's up like six or seven percent, and the beers, the finished beers have got much darker. So you're looking so you're looking at the ones from um, right at the start of the 19th century, before black malt, they're coming out in the low 20s SRM. So they're just a dark brown colour. They're not that dark at all. And then you see they start going up as the century goes on, and then they start getting up to 30, 35. 
So there's a definite trend in this. And you see people complained in the middle of the 19th century. Some drinkers, like drinkers always do, they complained about the beer changing and they were moaning about it being too dark and it wasn't the beer that they knew. And that's true. It did get much darker. And the taste probably changed as well. When you're using a large, when you're cutting back on the brown malt and putting in quite a lot of black malt, that's going to give you a very different flavor, I think, a very different character to the beer than when it's just brown malt and, and pale malt. So black malt uh, was invented, I think you said 18, early 1800s, right? 1817. Uh, 1817. The, the, what you find is there was a, a brief period when they allowed it, um, burnt sugar, so effectively caramel, as a coloring only for porter and stout. And that was repealed in 1816. And the following year, black malt appeared. So it was basically answering a need. So people needed something to colour the beer uh, that was legal in the system because at the time there was a Reinheitsgebot in Britain, so you you could only use malt. Interesting. You couldn't use, you couldn't use did, anything else. I did not know there was one, actually. How, how long did the Reinheitsgebot last in England? Uh, in England, uh, up until 1880. Wow. I had no idea. Uh, I mean, it, got, it was modified a little in 1847 when they allowed sugar. But other than that, it was just complete malt only. Hmm. Um, well, before, let's take one step back and, and can you describe for us uh, what stout might have tasted like uh, before the invention of porter, maybe in the, I don't know, uh, 17th century, 18th century? Um, it's very difficult to say. I, I, I generally don't go back before 1700 because everything's too vague. Okay. You, you only really start getting what I would consider sources that are good enough to really base anything on in the 18th century. Um, the earlier stuff, it's, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's not precise enough for, for me. Okay. I mean, it, pro it probably tasted something similar. It would have been a, you know, a, a, a dark beer. They, they were probably aging beer because aging beer predates Porter. So, but it wouldn't have been done in the breweries. It would have been done either in the pub or by someone, some beer handler. But I assume, I assume it was a fairly strong beer, and uh, you said probably most likely made from a brown malt base or something like that? Yeah, so it would have been 100% 100, 100 brown malt. Um, if you look at the the strength, of, there's, there's actually some fairly... I'm going to look this up because I've got got some actual numbers for this. Okay. On on the strengths of beers, because the, the very first... Um, so we're talking now 1700s, right? Yeah, so you've got Richardson, who did some of the earliest experiments with the uh, um, uh, hydrometer. And so he took some, he did a whole load of things, in, I think it was about mid-1770s. Okay. So this is, quite, this is quite early to have any actual real information. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't list brown stout, but it does list porter. And mm -hmm. the porter varies from... 1064 to 1081. Well, the stronger ones, but they probably actually are stout, to be honest. Um, so you're looking at the ordinary porter was was probably over six percent, yeah. six six and a half percent in the 1770s. So so stout would have been started off one one and a half percent stronger that than that and gone up. Wow. Um, so I uh, so I mean you're talking about eight percent probably, right? Uh, eight percent more. Wow, it's quite a bit. <laughs> Yeah, I can see I mean, why when, they were strong. Yeah, I mean, when you get to the to the first ones where I've actually got brewing records, um, it, it, it's what you have to realize is all the strengths went down after after the 1770s because Britain's fights in a whole series of wars, um, which obviously cost money, and so the the tax on beer and malt went up, and so you see strengths go right down during the Napoleonic Wars and only go back up again after 1815 when the tax comes down again, mm -hmm. and then the strengths go up. Um, so it's, it's, it's something you see in all the wars Britain's ever fought in, any, any, all of the major ones. They always put up the tax on beer and brewers, brewers cut the strengths. Interesting. Um, yeah, we talked yeah. about certainly talked about that when we did the World War II, World War I episodes. Uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's Napoleonic Wars, exactly the same thing. It, it's, it's completely predictable. Um, and, and as in the other wars, it had some lasting effects on beer. Right. Um, partly in it, in it made... The London brewers who were brewing on a large scale, it made them be as efficient as possible because they had to use the, the smallest number of amount of materials. I mean, this is why they changed the grist. This is why they stopped using 100 percent brown malt. It was because they wanted to make it cheaper. And because you got much better yield from pale malt, even though it was a little bit more expensive than brown malt, it worked out much cheaper to brew basically from pale malt. And this is what the brewers were looking for with with um, black malt. 
they really wanted to have something a beer where they could have almost all of it pale malt and then just a little bit of highly colored malt to get the color they needed because that was the most efficient and the cheapest way to brew i mean you also have to realize it's to, to do with the tax system so the malt tax was per quarter right mm. and nowadays a quarter is is said to be 336 pounds but back in the 18th century and for most of the 19th century it was not a weight measure it was a volume measure and because brown malt pops up pops up or at least the brown malt they had back then you get a far less weight per quarter of brown malt than compared to pale malt so pale malt's about 336 pounds what the normal the nominal weight of it was later the darker malts are only about 250 pounds a quarter so it's quite a big difference and if you're paying the same tax on that, it means that the tax per pound is actually much higher on brown malt than it is on pale malt. Um, how popular was stout compared to porter, say, in the late 1700s? I, I know porter was wildly popular for a time there, especially in London, right? Um, yes. Well, well, porter was wildly popular in London. Um, I mean, still really popular in 1900. Um, it's only really World War One and afterwards that porter dies off in london it, mm -hmm. it, it disappeared from a lot of the rest of the country after 1880 um you didn't really get draft porter anywhere though people were still brewing things that were basically like porters uh bottling them and calling them nourishing stout or some rubbish like that this is what fuller's did if you look at fuller's brewing records their porter carries on right into the 1950s wow. they weren't actually they weren't actually selling it as porter it was it was actually being bottled and sold as nourishing stout and it's only probably maybe 10 years after they'd stopped having porter that they actually changed the brew house name to nourishing stout interesting but it was probably the same beer or basically the same beer uh it would have started off the same um yeah and, and I, you don't know what they did to it because they, they might have done some priming to it before it was bottled to sweeten okay. it up so again so going back to the 1700s how, how popular was stout compared to i know porter was wildly popular how popular was stout then uh, stout was ne uh, stout was never as popular. It was it was, it was far smaller quantities of it brewed. So a bit, um, bit I, more of a niche thing, probably because of the extra, the, not only the strength, but probably the added cost, I guess. Yeah, the price and and, and the strength. So so it was, it, it ne they never sold as much stout as they did porter. That they, they um, not until porter had basically disappeared. Um, so I've, I've got some figures from from Whitbread from later. And that's probably something similar. I'll just say, because Whitbread are really good. You can see the, they give exactly the, they, they have in their brewing records, it has this, this section where it gives the output per month, month of all the different types of beer. So I can see exactly how much they brewed of each of their beers. And I think Stout was never more than about 20% of what Porter was. So mm -hmm. it was a, very much a, 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 a minority drink compared to, to Porter. But it, it was... It was enough so most pubs would have sold it. It's just that they would have been selling, you know, 10 times as much porter. Okay. So as we enter uh, the 1800s, you mentioned black malt obviously changed things uh, pretty dramatically. Um, how did how did stout evolve uh, uh, over that period? I mean, for example, you mentioned there used to be light stouts and, and all, a wide variation in color of stouts. Uh, uh, how did, 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 did that change a lot in that time? Um. Well, those you see those those the other stouts disappearing in, in the start of the nineteenth century. So that's kind of uh, when, yeah. So that's kind of when they disappeared. Is when the brown, or I'm sorry, when the black malt came on the scene. Yeah, around the same period. Yeah, though they, they weren't necessarily linked to two events. Um, and, and what you see in, in London is as a London stout starts to diverge from the stouts brewed in most other places, so that in London. They stick with brown malt. There's a couple of times when Whitbread, for a while, dropped brown malt and, and brewed from just pale and black malt. But then they brought the brown malt back and stuck with it then right through until the 1970s. Um, so, but, but in the rest of the country, what happens is brewers go over to a simplified grist. They drop the brown malt and they just blew, brew from pale and black. And that's what Guinness did as well. They, they dropped brown malt fairly early and went over to just pale and black malt. And then, though it's complicated, the thing with, with the black malt that they used in in, in Guinness, because <coughs> it was 
it was stuff specially made for them and, and people say it was sort of like somewhere between brown and black malt <laughs> kind of a, so when did, did they ever switch over to a stout roast i thought i thought modern guinness is made with more of a stout roast you know unmalted barley that's burned to a crisp yeah but they, they could only do that after 1880 i see okay. it was illegal before then um so, so um but going back in the in the uh, 1800s now we're talking when did all of the other branches uh, flip off, you know, you know, sort of sort of branch off here? And I'm talking about like milk stout and sweet stout and some of the other variations in stout. Well, uh, talking about stout splitting apart in different places, what you see in Scotland at the end of the 19th century is these really weird stouts come around, which have very poor attenuation and couldn't have been very hoppy because most of them were using spent hops. So they were using hops that had been, already been used in a previous brew. Hmm. So, yeah, they weren't going to be very bitter, especially when they're only like 55% attenuated. So these are very odd beers. that you, I've not seen beers like this in, in, in England or anywhere else. So these predate Milk Stout. And then you have, obviously you have Milk Stout comes along with Mackerson in uh, 1911. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it doesn't really make much of an impression before World War One, And then after World War One, everyone wants to have Milk Stout. Uh, and so it goes crazy. Uh, just everyone was brewing one. This, these being with lactose added. Though some people did brew sweet stouts, which didn't have lactose. One of the great things about Whitbread's bit of in, industrial espionage from the 50s is that they were very interested in milk stout because it was one of their biggest sellers in the form of Mackeson. And so they were always analysing other people's stouts. And it very handily says if they have lactose in them or not. And there's some ones that are very obviously very sweet because the attenuation's poor, but which don't have lactose in them. So they've obviously just stopped the fermentation or added sugars, sugar later in the process and, and then pasteurised the beer so it didn't ferment anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, oatmeal stout, that comes... A, that's about 1900, the first one, maybe a little bit before. Okay. Um, first one from Maclay's in Scotland, which was a really high percentage of oat malt, so I think 30, 35%. That's that starts high, get, yeah. Yeah, that starts getting copied quite widely before World War I, so very quickly it seems to take off. Most ones, and especially the London ones, are a complete joke. They've rarely got more than about 1%. Uh, oats in them hmm. so so a total minimal amount it's just purely there for legal purposes interesting so um you did some research into stout mashing which involves uh a lot of mis- different mashes multiple steps um oh god what are, what are they, they so tell us a little about these you know why were some of these things done what were they trying to accomplish and uh, I'll be uh when did it you. change i guess too i'll be honest with you i can't understand what the hell they're doing in some cases <laughs> um they're very complicated. You've got generally at the start of the 19th century, the London brewers are going for four mashes, no sparges. So four four step mash, I guess. Is that correct? Four steps? No, four separate mashes. Oh, four separate mashes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So they'd mash, leave it to stand, drain it off, put more water in, stir it up to mix them up properly, leave it a while, draw that off. We keep repeating this. Um, though sometimes the the last mash was really just for what they called a return wort. So that would be something that would be quite low gravity, like maybe 1006, 1007. Huh. And that would just be used as mashing water in a later brew. So so what what are they what temperatures are they using? What are they actually trying to accomplish with all these steps? Like, what temperatures are they using? They're like- using all all sorts of different temperatures. All sorts of different temperatures. Um, yeah, and, and it's different between the different breweries. Uh, some of them, especially the later ones, you, you'll see it looks like a, a, a sort of step mash. So they'll start off at maybe about 148 or something. Okay, so maybe kind of a protein rest kind of thing or something. Yeah, exactly. and then they'll do another another mash after that that's a few degrees higher. Um, and then they'll do lighter mashes, sometimes at really high temperatures. Sometimes they've got strike temperatures of over 200. Wow. Uh, yeah, that doesn't make much sense. But uh... <laughs> Yeah, and, and sometimes they have really low strike temperatures. So, you know, they might have a final I mean, you mash. I mean, you, know, you could use the lower strike temperatures if you have under-modified malts, which they may have had at the time. I don't know. Uh, 
to help yeah, to help that, develop the enzymes you need for later. But but I'm not quite sure. Yeah, exactly what they're trying to accomplish with all these different steps. I mean, I think the idea is that they're trying to get everything out of the malt. This this is the thing because they're trying to brew very efficiently. I, I mean, I suppose I know if I look at other brewers. So brewers outside London, they're not mashing in such a complicated way because, yeah, they don't have to need they don't have the need to be as efficient as the London brewers do that are brewing on large quantities in a very competitive market. Hmm. So uh, you, you mentioned I, and I, I, it was interesting. I, I think a lot of these brewers were huge, right, at the time? Yeah, I mean, you're looking at the, the largest <laughs> brewers. I'm going to find this because I've got I've got all the numbers on this as well. It's amazing how, the, how all the figures are. But one of the reasons that the numbers are so good for, for London breweries is because of the tax system, because there was a tax per barrel. And so they kept exact count, the government, of how many barrels everyone was brewing. Huh. So well, I, mean, I, was, if you look- I, I can't remember. I think I read a story <laughs> one time about a brewery where the uh, a part of it collapsed or something. It actually flooded like a city block or something. Was yeah, that was, that was Mukes. That, that was on the corner of... Um, Tottenham Court Road and Oxford Street, so right in the centre of, of the shopping district nowadays. And yeah, yeah they had a, a huge vat burst and I think half a dozen people were killed because it partially demolished some buildings. <laughs> Amazing. Demolished buildings with beer, huh? Yeah. So I'm, I'm just looking here. So in, in 1790, the largest London brewery produced 175,000 barrels. Wow. And, that, yeah, that's... And, that's, and that's imperial barrels. That's uh, that's a lot of beer, and there were three other breweries producing more than a hundred thousand barrels. Wow! At that point, yeah, that's a lot of beer. And by eighteen fifteen, the largest was Barclay Perkins, and they produced three hundred and thirty-seven thousand barrels. That's incredible. Yeah, that's that's a tremendous amount of beer. So at the um, time, they were probably ten times as large as the largest brewery on the continent. Wow! <laughs> Amazing. And that's um, just one brewery. Yeah, one brewery. Um, well, uh, you also found that a form of party guile brewing was commonly done to produce uh, different strengths, I guess, from one batch, right? Yeah, that, that, well, it gets more common the, the further you go through the, the century. So in the early part, most of the beers are being brewed single guile. Occasionally you get breweries like Whitbread where they weren't producing much stout and they party guile it with their porter. But most of them were, were, were brewed separate single guiles. Once you start getting past 1860, 1870, you find that they that they're mostly party guiling either the strong, mostly so party guiling the, the, the stouts together, sometimes with porter as well, but mostly it's the stouts that are being party guiled together. And then you have Truman who just do weird stuff. Uh, I, I can't work out what they were doing. They they would party guile, blend together the warts variously, so they got three different strengths. Okay. Fem- so fem- ferment them, and then blend again post fermentation. So uh, let me get that straight. So they're divide. You know, party guile, of course, is where you take you take one mash and you divide it into several different uh, beers, potentially of different strengths, based on the running. So they're 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 basically dividing it and then combining it again at the end. What what? Well, no, they're, 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 they're blending it twice Be- because the, it's not that you get the first wort and that's the that's one beer. No. If you've got three warts, yeah, they get, all three warts go into every beer. Okay, just different, just different proportions. Interesting. So they're so I guess that by doing that, they get vary the strength of the finished beer somehow. Well, I don't know. They, they, they I, I really can't see the point in it personally yeah. <laughs> because they could control because they were party guy and they could control the the um, you control the gravity, the right gravity up front, of the beers right? anyway. Yeah. You can measure it right up front, right? Yeah, well, this is one of the things, one of the advantages of party guiling is that you can hit the exact gravity that you want, starting gravity every time, because you just have to blend the, the warts in the right in the right proportions. Right, right. Um, so it's weird. So they'd, they'd brew like twice as much of the imperial stout as they were going to use, and then they'd blend that into the double and single stout after fermentation. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, unless maybe it was just uh, more efficient for them. Well, I can't, probably wasn't more efficient, but I was you know, more efficient to do a higher gravity uh, I'm, work. I'm, I have I'm, no idea. I'm, yeah, kind of it's, it's something that completely puzzles me. Seems like you and go then, to a higher gravity work, it's probably less efficient, but I don't know. So Yeah, and, and then you'd also have another level of blending, because then you get not only the post-fermentation, you get the post-aging blending, which is when you'd age the mixed 
old and young beer together. So, I mean, that you have, they, they actually stay. They'll have keeping and running versions of the porter and of the stouts. Well, I mean, I can see some rationale for that because obviously the older beer is going to have a much different flavor than the younger beer. And there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of breweries even today that'll, that'll blend older and newer beer and same things done in the wine industry, for example. Well, I, I, I mean, I've, I've become totally convinced of it by, by a couple of beers I've done with Goose Island. So we did a porter, which was a, a runner and a, and a keeper, mm -hmm. so two Truman's beers. And the blend was definitely better than either of the individual components, because what you'd got is that the, the aged beer by itself, this was beer that had been aged about 12 months, it was a bit too much. And the young beer was a bit, lacked a bit of depth of flavour, but one third old in the young, and it just made a much more rounded beer. And it, it's a way of getting aged flavour into a younger beer, so you can never get the combination of flavors and character from a single fermentation that you can with blending beers. Yeah, um, and I think that's true. I, we see it a lot here with uh, breweries that specialize in sour beers and sour barrel aged beers, those kinds of things. A lot of times what you pull off the barrel is not perfect, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, even if it's been aged a long time. And so if you blend it with something that's a little bit younger and maybe not quite as strong, it kind of mellows it out and, and creates a, a better combination. Yeah, but I mean, the interesting thing with Porter is that they weren't going for the, this really um, big, powerful aged beers, which people might be doing now, nowadays. They were basically producing a beer that was a mass market beer, but they wanted to have some aged character in it. I see. So so they're using the older beer just to, to accent it, I guess, right? Yeah, that, that, that that's exactly it. And, and it was great because we, at the... At the at the release party they had at the tap room, they had the unblended and the blended version. Mm -hmm. And it was really interesting to compare the, the, the three of them. I bet. And, yeah. and the blend was definitely the best of the three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, stout maintained its popularity through the late 1800s, uh, even though lagers were on the rise. How, how did the rise of lagers, say, in the late 1800s uh, start to change things? Oh, it had absolutely no impact on London stout. Interesting. Um. Uh, right. Loads of people went bust founding lager breweries in Britain in the 1870s and 1880s. They <laughs> so almost all... So it didn't. Uh, so people did not change over to lager like they did, say, uh, more in the continent or even here in the US, huh? Yeah, not, not at all. Pe people tried in the 1870s. You first get lager coming over in large quantities in the 1860s after the Paris exhibition. Uh -huh. um, when you had Dreyer had caused a big fuss with his uh, Vienna lager. And so after that, in the 1860s, you start getting lager coming to, to Britain, mostly Vienna-style lager, but also some Bavarian-type lagers. And because of the money that was paid for these, quite a few people thought, all oh, right, we can make some money at this, uh, and set up lager breweries. Uh, virtually all of them went bankrupt very quickly. Interesting. So it wasn't until much, much later, uh, probably after what, what World War One, World War Two, that lagers became more popular in Britain? Um, in 1960, lager accounted for one percent of the beer drunk in Britain. Wow, I had no idea. I thought so it was it more was, like here in the U.S., where you know, obviously they dominated for many, many decades. No, totally minimal. Um, what 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 competed with with porter and stout was mild. Hmm. Yeah. So so from about 1850, 1860 to 1960, mild was the most popular style in the U.K. Interesting. In, in 1960, about 50 percent of all beer drunk. Well, uh, we talked uh, quite a bit uh, before on our previous episodes about World War One and World War Two and how the rationing restrictions uh, changed a lot of things. <laughs> Can you talk us talk us through the impact on stouts and porters here? Um, oh, one thing I would say when we're talking yeah, about ahead, stouts, po stouts popularity, it's probably more popular now than it's ever been. Stout is, you mean? In the form of Guinness. Guinness is the largest selling brand in the UK at Guinness, the moment. Uh, so Guinness sells very well in in uh, in England as well, I guess. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's well, it's sold everywhere. I know. I had I had an experience. I was traveling through Ireland and I tried to order a stout that wasn't Guinness. <laughs> and the guy yeah. at the bar goes, "Oh no, you want a Guinness?" And he poured me a Guinness, even though I asked for <laughs> another one. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, and yeah. So so. so in Britain, really, the only mass market stout is Guinness. So they pretty much got the market to, to themselves. Hmm. Um, I mean, obviously, the smaller breweries that make it, but in terms of mass, mass appeal, they, they, they dominate. 
Anyway, but we'll, I mean, there, we'll are, there are still uh, even today a few a few other breweries making other kinds of stout: the sweet stout, the milk stout, and so on. Yeah, right. I mean, you've got Murphy's, which is obviously because it's owned by Heineken. That you see that a lot, quite a lot over here. Yeah, yeah. So, anyways, um, go on. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. World War One and World War Two. Um, yep. World War One. People still keep that. I, I still see people saying that uh, people weren't allowed to roast malts during World War Two. No, that was never something. What did happen was for a certain length of time, people weren't allowed to make any malt at all. It was completely banned. And then for a while, you had to have a, a license from the government to be able to malt because they were trying to, to hang on to the grain supplies. Well, obviously, World War One, World War Two, we saw the gravities drop dramatically, right? And we also mm -hmm. saw a lot of substitution of ingredients, correct? Yeah, yeah. Um, Basically, things like maize disappear, especially in World War Two, and gets replaced by flake barley. Um, uh, sugar, the, the amount of sugar used went down. So, in fact, the malt content goes up often of beers during the two wars hmm. because malt was the thing they could get hold of. And also malt isn't as useful for, for making food from, whereas sugar and maize, they've obviously got lots of food uses. Um and the, the same with hops, there's no, m m not much use for them. So the, well, in fact, they, what happened with hops in, in World War One was that they pulled up, ripped up a third of the fields um, because they didn't need that many hops. Um, but what what you have happened in World War One is um, most breweries that I look at the records of, very few of them seem to have brewed port around stout all through the war. Hmm. Most of them seem to brew either one or the other. But what you hear reports of in newspapers and stuff is is people saying, well, porter and stout, they'd sell them and they might charge a different price for them, but they're actually exactly the same. And from what I've seen of brewers records, I'm pretty sure that's what was actually happening, that they were, they just had the one beer and they might market, market it as porter or they might market it as stout. Um, and it was a bit random. Uh, and, but what happened? I mean, there wasn't, it? there was, yeah, one time there wasn't a lot of difference, right? No, uh, uh, towards the end of the war, but just because the beers had got so weak. Yeah. Um, what you see happen at the uh, at the end of the war is that Porter initially they brew it as a sixpenny beer, so sixpence a pint, which means it was ten forty, ten forty two, ten forty three. Okay. And then after about a year or two, they decide to do it as a either a fivepenny beer or a fourpenny beer, which means either ten thirty seven or ten thirty two. So quite so, a quite a bit weaker, probably closer to a, a modern Guinness then, huh? Well, weaker than that, and yeah. that seems to have killed off killed off Porter. It seems you you see the I can see from Whitbread because I can see the sales of it every every year, and their and their sales plummet after nineteen twenty two. So they it it came back reasonably well after the war, and then after a after a few years, they're brewing like twenty thousand barrels a year. When the when the, the total output of the brewery is half a million barrels, and uh, what did stout look like after the war? How did the recipes change uh, after World War Two? Um, depends on where. I mean, if we're talking London stout, most most breweries decided to brew it as an eightpenny beer, so, so a little bit stronger. Um, about ten fifty five. Um, so probably probably still not 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 as quite a, quite as strong as before the war, huh? No, before the war, it would have been um, 1070, 1075. Right, right. Some, something like there. that. Yeah, and, and that would be, that's, that'd be single stout. You'd also have had double and treble, treble stout. So 1085, 1095, something like that, 1100. Hmm. So pretty strong beers. Those don't come back. You only Most breweries brew one or two stouts. It, it varies a bit. Um, so eight, eight penny one would be the sort of like the, the, the sort of flagship stout. Some breweries went for a weaker one. So about 1048, some breweries made both. Um, and then you start getting all the weird bottles stouts coming in. So often quite low gravity. Um, and then you have all the milk stouts come in. So milk stouts. They, they weren't actually that weak originally. Normally they were about 1055, 1060. Uh -huh. Unlike the sort of later 1950s and 1960s ones, which were, you know, maybe three, three and a bit percent alcohol. So 
you had some decent strengths stouts, and they're, and they're quite diverse. One interesting thing to see the, 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 the result of World War II is to compare Guinness and London brewed stouts from the 30s with their stouts after the war. Okay. And what you, and what you see is that before the war, they're actually quite similar. They're a similar gravity, about 1055, and about the same level of attenuation, about 75%. After the war, you see that the London stouts are really different. The attenuation has, has really gone down. Most of them are well under 70%. Whereas Guinness has gone the opposite way, and Guinness has gone up to 80% plus. Hmm. So the whole thing about Guinness as being a dry stout only dates from the early 1950s. Before that, before that, it wasn't anything like as attenuated. And so there's this. So whereas before the war, they're, they're sort of generally quite similar to the London brewed and, and well, I say London brewed, Guinness was London, brewed in London as well. Yeah. But but there's a difference between the other London brewed stouts and Guinness, and it's quite a big divergence and yeah this is why people think oh you know english stouts are all only sweet you do still get some ones that are fairly well attenuated after the war but they're very rare well in london they're quite rare do you, um, do you, do you have an idea when guinness switched over from uh from the black malt to the uh yeah more stout roast the unmalted uh, uh stout roast um i used to think it was wasn't all that early but since I've, they now let me into the Guinness archives and have a look, had a look. I found some, I think from uh, 1892 or something like that, hmm. somewhere in the 1890s, and it got roast barley in it. So that's when they that's when they switched over, and that that of course gives it a drier finish too, as well, right? Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it's it's, it's Guinness. It's, it's 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 really interesting Guinness because you have these this be people called Plunkett Brothers, who was a, a malt roasters which was right next to the Guinness Brewery. Okay. And they seem to have basically used them as their house roasters. Hmm. And so they, they and so they had the stuff made very much to their own specifications. Right. Makes sense. Um, we also see that a lot of the other variations actually did survive the war, although in smaller quantities. Uh, London Stout, Oatmeal Stout, Milk, Sweet Stout, and of course we already talked about Irish Stout. Well, and Imperial. Oh, yeah, well, an Imperial Stout. Don't forget oh, that. imperial stout. Yeah, I'm sorry, Russia or so-called Russian imperial stout, right? Which, yeah, but, which but, didn't but, originate I mean, in Russia, right? <laughs> no, and may not have ever actually been really been for the Russian court. I'm, 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 I'm steering well clear of all those arguments now because I realise <laughs> I've been saying stuff that I basically just took, took from Barclay Perkins promotional material, and I should know better than that <laughs> because breweries often don't know their own history very well. So the Russian, the Russian imperial stout may not have been made for the Russian royal family then. Well, it, 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 there was a market in Russia for for these beers, but. Yeah, yeah, I, I think there's a bit, a bit of exaggeration gone on there. But I mean, these, I mean, in the early fifties, um, uh, Barclays Russian stack went up to the full pre-war strength, so eleven hundred plus. Wow, yeah, uh, which is it's one of the few beers that uh, ever re that uh, between the wars and after World War Two was brewed at the pre-World War One strands. So they actually did boost it back up. I, I guess it probably makes sense as a characteristic of it. But anyways, yeah. all these other stouts uh, did survive in some form after the war, right? Yeah, I mean, you you get I mean, you get the, the lots of milk stout in Scotland. You get these crazy sweet stouts. I mean, even even more insane than the ones I've been telling you about before. So you get ones that are only like forty five percent attenuated. Um, things that are one and a half percent ABV. I mean, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, I mean the strong sounds, ones. Are, sounds almost sickly. I don't know. Yeah, I'm not. I don't know if people drank them straight or mixed them because <coughs> they might have used it as a mixer with something else. Cut, cut them with something, uh, I guess. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, but I mean, milk stout was huge in the 1950s. Um, Mackerson was one of the biggest beer brands in the UK. Whitbread were brewing it all over the place, churning out very large quantities of it. Interesting. Um, but obviously, that, that that's a beer that beer style that became incredibly unpopular. Interesting. Well, um, what does uh, speaking of popularity? What does the popularity of stout look like today compared to its historical uh, uh, popularity? Um, there's probably more of it being sold now than than possibly ever. To be honest, in in the form of Guinness. Guinness, um, yeah, obviously. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's. 
it's, and it'd be hard to, to look at the actual numbers, but but it's it's actually in, in, like with Guinness, it's actually made quite a comeback. I think that they, they seem to be. Yeah, I mean, Guinness has become very popular even here. So yeah, I mean, they seem to have managed to to sell it to young people, which is quite an achievement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, they, they, they're doing something right, Guinness. Huh. Interesting. And uh, uh, what about the other varieties? Are they are they doing well? Are they surviving? Are they? Uh... Well, people started brewing milk stout again, which I found really weird. Uh, if you'd ever asked me, of the unlike styles not likely to make a comeback, milk stout would have been very high on them. And why is that? Was it just a fad in the fifties that fell out of favor, or what? Um, it just had such a bad image when I was young. It's just like it's just the stuff grannies drink. Oh, interesting. Yeah, you know, you know that that's that's not a good image for beer style. <laughs> okay, well, apparently it's making a comeback, huh? Yeah, I mean, oatmeal stout seems to have died out in the sixties, um, and then recently, you know, with. I think it was someone actually asked uh, Sam Smith to brew one, uh, the, the American importer. Yeah, I mean, the... over here in the U.S., these are all sort of niche craft beer kind of things that have, you know, uh, come back at, at various places due to the craft beer revolution, really. Uh, but they're still relatively small. I mean, as you probably know, almost, you know, more than half the craft beer sold here is IPAs now. Yeah, well, my, my, my last trip to the States, I... Well, last couple of trips to the States, I've found it very difficult to find any dark beers. It, it, and, uh, it is a challenge. I'm a dark beer fan myself. And I you know, used to be able to get them on the grocery shelves. Now, very hard to find in many cases. Uh, maybe you'll find one or two instances. And Guinness it, it quite often is on the grocery shelves still. But uh, but yeah, I've been disappointed. Unfortunately, the IPAs have, have pushed out a lot of the other styles. So Yeah, I mean, it, it, on draft, virtually all I could see was, was nitro stats. And I'm not a huge fan of nitro, so... I wasn't particularly going to go and drink them. It was just annoying not to be able to just get a, a normal stout, you know, just yeah. something 7% dark, roasty, you know? Well, and then the other the other problem I've run into here is a lot of times I go to order a porter or a stout and it's actually like a dark IPA instead, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, there's all sorts of other rubbish in it. Yeah, yeah. Um. Anyways, uh, I appreciate you coming today to talk about stouts. I wanted to get your closing thoughts uh, sort of on the history of stout, uh, what it is, how it's evolved. Well, it's, it's it's an interesting style. It's it's been around a long time. It's changed quite a lot over the years. You know, strengths, ingredients, flavor profile, color. Uh, yeah, it, it, it's yeah, it, it, but that's a, that's true for all beer styles, really. But but because stout's been around quite a long time as a well-defined style, it's obviously gone had time to go through a lot more changes than more recent styles. Mm-hmm. So I mean, it, it was you know at least uh, the the thing with Guinness is fairly reassuring that. It doesn't look like it's going to disappear from from the UK and Ireland anytime soon. No, they got um, a pretty strong marketing arm there. Yeah, so so yeah, it's it's quite nice that it's going to be around for for a bit longer. It's, uh, it's not like mild. Uh, it's, uh, that is depressing <laughs> looking at mild. It's, people say there's there's some sort of revival in it, but I can't see it. It's, uh, it's and nothing I, like. I, I haven't been back to London in a few years, but how? I mean, how are the you know things like the milds and the real ales doing there? Are they all getting pushed out, or are they still well, surviving? Well, I mean, you can get cask beer reasonably easy, but but milds you struggle to find anywhere. Hmm. Um, Interesting, especially cask milds. I, I know, I'm, I'm, I know one place that always sells it, which is one of the Harvey's pubs, which is a brilliant place, mm-hmm. uh, and the milds really good. So I normally go there when I'm in London if I want a pint of mild. Nice. But otherwise, yeah, you'd, you'd, unless you know really know where to go, you're not going to find it. Well, Ron, uh, appreciate you coming on the show today to talk about historical beers and uh, really enjoy well, talking about fun. stouts, of course, because I one of my favorite beer styles for personally. Um, so thank you again for coming on. Yeah, well, and hopefully people can look out for, for the book. So it should hopefully be finished in a month or two. And then they'll be able to read all these amazing facts about the history of uh, Stout in London. Well, they can find it on your uh, on your blog, which I'll mention in just a second. Uh, my guest today was Ron Pattinson. Ron is the author of dozens of books on historical brewing, and I think you can find all of his books at his blog at uh, Barclay Perkins, Barclay, B-A-R-C-L-A-Y, perkins.blogspot.com. Thanks again, Ron. Okay, no problem. A big thank you to Ron Pattinson for joining me this week. Thanks also to Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They offer access to videos, brewing courses, exclusive articles, and the amazing Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. 
Go to beerandbrewing.com to get your subscription today. And I recently updated the payment system for Beersmith to give you more options to purchase or renew your Beersmith, de Beersmith desktop and web-based brewing software. You can now purchase two and three-year licenses at a discount, and you can use Venmo and Square for non-subscription payments. Purchase a license or start your free trial of Beersmith today. Go to beersmith.com. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Thank you.